Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, <clears throat> any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord with, uh, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility <clears throat> count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to your his own look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Joel, come preach the word. Good morning, men. I just want to say thank you for allowing me the opportunity to to be here this morning. I uh, I don't make my way to Lubbock much, but I understand Lubbock's not necessarily a destination hot spot, is the way I was in, informed today. But it is good to be with you, and I. Uh, I appreciate the kindness. I, it's my first time to the school. Um, most of my uh, interaction with individuals from the school takes place at Lake Tahoe Family Encampment every year. Uh, and so that's where I got to know some of the individuals that represent Sunset. And then, of course, it uh, is one of the things that Carrie Williams and his wife, Lenora, Lenora works for Freed Hardeman as well. And so there's that connection. Uh, but this is my first time, and I look forward to getting to know you, getting to interact with you. Um, and get to tell you a little bit about why I'm even here and why Freed Hardeman thinks it's a good idea to, to bring me on board to go around and talk to schools of preaching and to, to set up a table and tell people about the College of Biblical Studies. I, I would like to save most of that for the luncheon uh, at noon. I've, I've got Chick-fil-A ordered. I hope you're okay with Chick-fil-A. And uh, we're going to set that up and have a good time uh, at that event. But it is good to be with you this morning. This morning for the chapel lesson, what I would like to do is uh, open up the Word of God to the book of Philippians and hopefully, in the time that we will spend together, offer something very practical to you that you will be able to use no matter where you choose to serve God. And I would offer this to you that even outside of your service to God, the things that we're going to talk about this morning are actually beneficial uh, to your family. They're going to be beneficial to your marriage. They're going to be beneficial to the relationships that you have in life across the board. And that's because when, when we read through God's Word, the application, while specifically in context, is meant for the church at Philippi, that there are, there are nuggets, there, there are moments that we can take away some concepts and say, you know what, if I make application like this in my life regularly then I know it will bless me. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is join me this morning in the book of Philippians, a letter that was written to a church that uh, was having some problems. Uh, we know they were having problems because over in chapter 4, we run into some individuals that you know too well in your studies, I'm sure, verse 2, Yodia and Syntyche, individuals who are in great company when it comes to faithfulness. As a matter of fact, sometimes we believe that disagreements and disgruntledness within congregations only occurs when it's unfaithful brethren. Well, I've got to, some truth to tell you, and, and there's nothing in this that, that indicates that either one of these women had abandoned the faith. Sometimes personalities come into play. We're not even told really what they're arguing about. Perhaps they're arguing about whether they should have chairs or pews, you know, back in Philippi. I'm sure that was a big issue, right? Uh, probably not, but reality is this, that whatever was going on, it was spilling into the congregation. And the only way that we know that, if I look at the text, I see that after he talks about Yodia and Syntyche living in harmony, chapter 4, verse 2, he addresses one that he calls true companion in verse 3. And he says, Indeed, true companion, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement, also in the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are in the book of life. These ladies are in great company. These ladies are not just Sunday morning attenders. They, they have put themselves out there. They, they probably at their own expense and at their own sacrifice, in whatever way possible, they have shared in the struggle for the cause of the gospel of Jesus Christ along with Paul. But what I do know is this, whatever's going on, it's got to be bigger than just these two ladies. Otherwise, the Apostle Paul would not have reached out to this one that he calls true companion. Now, I know there are individuals that will interpret that in numerous ways. I tend to 
just stay within the text. What can I find from the text? And so I go back to chapter 1, and I look at verse 1, where the Apostle Paul identifies himself, and then he identifies the audience of this letter, which he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. So I know the letter's written to all the Christians who are in Philippi, and I don't necessarily understand a contextual break between chapter uh, 1, verse 1, and chapter 4, verse 3, where another person is introduced. And so it's my conclusion, he's saying this to the church. He's saying, church, it's time for you to help these two sisters. you got to help them. And there's a time that disagreements can be handled between two individuals, but when it spills over, that's when you've got to help individuals out as a congregation. And of course, at the end of the day, the question is asked, why? Why would Paul care? It's because this disagreement is, is taking something away that the church at Philippi would otherwise enjoy and that the apostle wants them to enjoy. Now, what we're going to do this morning as a, a word, picture, and imagery, I, I don't have it on the screen. I have a triangle on the screen, but I want you to envision something. This morning, we're going to build um, an ice cream sundae. Okay, some people may call it a banana split. I don't care what you call it, but what I want to do is this. I want to put an image in your mind. And if I can put an image in your mind and then fill in what those levels are in that ice cream sundae, then the goal is for you to walk away from this morning's study and say, I know what an ice cream sundae represents according to the book of Philippians. And then next time you eat an ice cream sundae, you're going to say, oh, wait, that, that beautiful bald-headed man from Tennessee came and told us about the book of Philippians and, and ice cream, and I get it now, okay? So here's the deal. This is purely as a way for you to have a mental image. But at the end of the day, I want you to understand something. Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wants the church at Philippi to know something that they are void of at this time. He wants them to have a deeper understanding of what is called joy in this particular book. And, and the word joy, if you've ever studied the book of Philippians from the standpoint of joy or rejoice, and, and somebody taught you that that was a key central theme to this particular book, then they taught you well. That is absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, that word joy is saturates this entire Four chapter letter. You can find it over in chapter 1, verse 18, where the Bible will trans translate that as rejoice. You'll actually see it over in chapter 1, verse 4, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. You'll see it over in chapter 2, verse 2, make my joy complete. Chapter 2, verse 17, I rejoice and share my joy with you all. Chapter 2, verse 18, I urge you, rejoice in the same way and share your joy. You'll see it over in chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. You'll see it in chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And here's, here's what I do when I study Scripture. When I see a word or a phrase that is repeated over and over again, I may not know the Greek behind it. I may not know the tense and, and the mood. But what I do know is this. Man, he used that word a lot. And if he used it a lot... That must be significant. You see, I'm a married man. And I understand when my wife uses words a lot, and the same word repeated like dishes or vacuum, I don't have to stand back and wonder what she has in mind. Because she has repeated it over and over again. Well, in Bible study, it's helpful to notice patterns like that. Either patterns in form or patterns when it comes to repetitive words. And so what I offer to you is this, in a short four-chapter letter, if, if the Apostle Paul thought enough of this, then we ought to think enough of it. But what I want you to imagine is this, in this ice cream sundae concept, joy is the cherry on top of the sundae. It's the idea that if you were to walk in and I said, hey, we're having ice cream sundaes for lunch, and I give you a bowl, and it just has one of those little red cherries in it, you would feel cheated. And you would look back and you would say, I don't know how they do things in Tennessee. But in Texas, this is not an ice cream sundae, Joe. And you would be correct. Because all it would be is a bowl with a cherry in it. But you see, it's also one of those things, when you see an ice cream sundae and they put that cherry on top, your, your thought is, now it's complete. Now it's whole. And so what I want you to understand is this, at the pinnacle, what the Apostle Paul wants for the church at Philippi is joy. He doesn't want circumstantial joy for them. He's not saying, hey, like a child who's got a present at their birthday party, 
and they open the present and they're happy with a present for a time and then they get tired of the present and they discard it because they're ready for what's coming next. He's not saying circumstances dictate your joy. And if that were the case, you got to look over at chapter 3 because he will offer three warnings. It's the same word over and over again, but the Apostle Paul does not mix words in chapter 3, verse 2 when he says, Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision. In other words, beware, beware, beware. Again, Bible study, he said it multiple times. That must be significant, and it is significant. Because these individuals had, had Jewish folks in their midst that were trying to teach them that in order to be pleasing to God, you had to, to become and integrate Judaism within your walk. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is, look, it's not based upon what they're telling you. And so he's not saying circumstantial joy. They would have struggled with that. What he is saying is this, so there's a joy that goes beyond the surface, that goes beyond the circumstance, that goes beyond the disagreements because it's rooted in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now that's what he wants for them. But I will say this, that's not the only thing he says is, is going to get them to where they need to be. You see, because there is another key word that occurs, and it's our second layer in this ice cream sundae, and, and it is the word fellowship, as we know it in the English, the word koinonia in the Greek. Now, that word koinonia occurs in chapter 1, verse 5, chapter 1, verse 7, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 3, verse 10, chapter 4, verse 14, and chapter 4, verse 15. There's no way you got them all. That means you have to go home and do research. But the idea behind that word is this. We look at it as the word fellowship. And sometimes if we're not careful, we'll look at what we're going to do at lunch today as, well, we had great fellowship. And I would tell you this, it is possible that we'll have fellowship at lunch. But I want you to also know this, that just because you eat a meal together doesn't mean you have fellowship. Do you know, you can sit in a church pew with the same people week after week and never have fellowship with them. You can be in the same building and never have fellowship because fellowship doesn't equal attendance. It doesn't, it doesn't mean just showing up. If that's the case, an individual who's blind who walks in with a, a seeing dog or a service dog, if all fellowship is is being in attendance, then you're in attendance with that dog. You're, you're in fellowship, rather, with that dog. And, and that doesn't make sense. You see, fellowship is an active term. It, it, it involves energy. It involves effort. It's rooted in belief. It's rooted in, in our understanding as, as we look at a biblical concept of fellowship, of a, of a doctrine, a standard of doctrine. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you can even have the agreement of standard of doctrine and not be truly in fellowship as this is spoken of in the book of Philippians. That's because just in looking at the English translation of the word koinonia, I find it quite interesting that in chapter 1, verse 5, the Bible reads this way, in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul's, Paul's saying up in verse 3, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Why is he thankful for them? Well, verse 5, in view of your participation uh, in the gospel from the first day until now. But that word participation is the Greek word for fellowship. Now, he'll also say the same Greek word down in verse 7 when the Bible reads this way, for it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart, since both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers of grace with me. I'm reading from the New American Standard in case you're curious. So the word participation, the word partaker, we then see in chapter 2 verse 1 the word fellowship. We see it again in chapter 3 verse 10, but it's over in chapter 4 that we see another English word that is offered as a translation for this word koinonia. And that word in verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well to share with me in my afflictions. And in verse 15, you yourselves also know, Philippians, that at, at the first preaching of the gospel, after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter. So we've got four basic words that are used to translate what we know is fellowship. Number one, you have fellowship, you have participation, you have partaking, and you have sharing. If I knew nothing else about fellowship, and I just simply looked at those words, what I would come to understand is this, that biblical fellowship means that we're pulling on the same side of the rope for the same cause. It would be the equivalent of me having a rope with a heavy weight on the end of it, and you see me pulling, 
And from the side, you say to yourself, I need to go over there and grab the rope and help him pull. So you would come over on the same side of the rope and together we would pull whatever weight that was. That is the concept of fellowship. What is not the concept of fellowship is where you see me pulling and then you stand over here and go, wow, he's got a lot on his shoulders. That's not fellowship. That is a recognition that a brother is in need and you stay back. It's also not fellowship for you to see me pulling on this side and you say, hey, let me help you. And you pick up the rope over here and start pulling this way. That's not fellowship. Because we are at odds with one another in the effort and in the goal of which we are trying to attain. But fellowship within the book of Philippians, it is participating in the same cause. I am partaking of the same endeavor. I am sharing in the same struggle. Therefore, we are said to be in fellowship. Now, here's what's beautiful about the book of Philippians. Paul wants them to have biblical joy. But before they're ever going to have biblical joy, they must have biblical fellowship. You see, I would view that as the ice cream on the ice cream sundae. If joy is the cherry on top, then the ice cream is fellowship. But if, again, if I were just simply to offer you ice cream and a cherry, you would say, Joe, that's a bowl of ice cream. And you would be correct. It's not quite the full picture of a Sunday. And so the question is, well, what is then that base level? I told you some may call it a banana split. I really don't care what you call it, but this is the banana in the ice cream Sunday. He says, if you're going to have biblical joy, it's got to be based upon biblical fellowship. But if you're going to have biblical fellowship, it's got to be based upon what is called phreneo. Phreneo is that concept of like-mindedness. Just as joy saturates the book of Philippians, and just like fellowship saturates the book of Philippians, phreneo saturates the book of Philippians. It's found in chapter 1, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 2, 2, 5, 3, 10, 3, 19, 4, 2, and 4, 10. And you look at that and you say, okay, Joe, you've said it. I get it now. If the author repeats a word over and over again, it's got to be significant. And I would tell you that this is the base level that the rest of it is built upon. Now, what does that word mean, though? When you really start looking at it, it it's quite interesting to consider. Sometimes it's translated heart in the New American Standard, chapter 1, verse 7. For it is only right for me to feel this way about you all because I have you in my heart. That is the Greek word phreneo. You also see it over in chapter 2. You see there on the screen, verse 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind Maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. It's found twice. Same mind, one purpose. You see it over in chapter 3, verse 15. Let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. And if anything, you have a different attitude. God will reveal that also to you. The word attitude. You see it over in chapter 4, verse 2. When he says, I urge Yodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Live in harmony is the Greek word phreneo. But even given those, the word heart, the word attitude, the word mind, uh, the word harmony, the question is asked, what does it really mean? And here's the best thing I can do for you. Sometimes Greek words are best understood as word pictures and not dictionary definitions. When I began preaching uh, 21 years ago in ministry, and and I started in youth and family work and then got into my pulpit, uh, first pulpit. I love the brethren in Columbia, Tennessee. They took a chance on a guy. Uh, when others had asked, you know, you've never, you've never preached before full-time, how do we, how are you going to know if you're up to the task or not? I mean, you, you, you encounter a lot when you're trying to transition out of youth and family work into preaching. And, and so these brethren took a chance on me, and, and they loved me through it. But they were some interesting people, and I say that lovingly. Lovingly in the sense of, at my tryout sermon, when I walked to the back, one of the men who says he was an usher, which I don't know how it is around here, but... Down south, where we're at, usher just means the old guy who sits in the comfy chair and pretends to be the security force. And I, if there's ever a need for security, I hope he's not the guy. You know what I'm saying? He, he wouldn't be able to, I mean, I, and I say that. Mike became one of my best friends, and I would say that to his face. Okay? But here's what happened. On my tryout, tryout lesson, I walk to the back, and Mike meets me at the very back. I don't know him at this point in time. And he says, was that the best you could do? That was what he asked. And I didn't know. I'm still thinking, man, i got to put on a, I'm trying to get this job, you know. And so I say, well, yes, sir, it was. I, I poured a lot into that. And man, he goes, well, that's all the good Lord asks of you then. I thought, whoa. 
But he's the same guy that after I'd gotten the job and went to the back, he called me over. He said, Preacher. See, I didn't have a name there. My, my name was Preacher. Preacher, come here. So I went over to him and he showed me a, 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 a quarter. And you know how some of the quarters have different states on the back of them now? Um, when he, he showed me one with a horse on the back. And he said, what kind of horse is that? And I looked it over. And I used to own horses. I have children now and I can't afford both. And I like being married, so I got rid of the horses. But the idea was this. I looked at the back of that quarter and I started studying it from the standpoint of how is it carrying its head, from the standpoint of how tall was it. And, and I looked back at him and I said, Mike, I don't think I, I can tell you. He goes, Joe, it's a quarter horse. That's the people I was dealing with, okay? Great people. I loved them. But they never had a problem complaining about the length of my sermons. They had mastered that. And so when I would go to the back, Mike would ask occasionally, Preacher, you went a little long today, didn't you? I thought, man, that's the way you want to get out of the pulpit and go to the back, right? Preacher, you went a little long today. Finally, I just started giving it back to him. And I said, well, I just thought you needed a little extra Jesus today. So that's our relationship. So I decided I was going to go in one morning and I was going to rotate the clock back 15 minutes. So when Mike and the others who like to give me a hard time were looking at it, nobody looks at it anyway unless you've got to go, you're bored or you get up to go to the bathroom, and that's when you're wanting to check the clock anyway, right? But the idea was this. I was going to roll it back, so when they looked at it and I finished, they were going, oh, you finished early. This is great. But before I could do that, they changed the clock out in the back of the auditorium with what's called an atomic clock. An atomic clock is one that you set the time zone, and a signal is sent... And the clock ticks on the minute and on the hour and on the second that the signal tells it to tick on. But not only did they replace that clock, they replaced every clock in the church building. I got the hint, but here's one thing that was very cool about that. It didn't matter what clock I was looking at in that that church building, they all ticked on the same hour, they ticked on the same minute, and they ticked on the same second. If I could give you any word picture what phroneo means, that's what it means. And you look at that and you'd say, there is no way. God knows his people. How could they ever tick on the same hour and on the same minute and on the same second? How could he ever make such a demand and a claim? And I would offer this to you. It is not logical in the ways that we think of it because we immediately start thinking, well, you know, that, what does that look like? And, and we all have our different positions that we play and we're all in different areas. But I would offer this to you. A congregation that understands Freneo is like a baseball team that understands what to do when the ball is hit. You see, on a winning baseball team, no one stands around. The ball may be hit to the left fielder, but the center fielder is running over to back up the left fielder. And what's beautiful is the shortstop has to go out to be the cutoff man. So the second baseman has to cover first ba- or second base. The pitcher oftentimes, until the base runner rounds first, has to back up a throw to the shortstop. But once the runner runs around first, typically runs around second, the pitcher will leave the infield and the first baseman will come to stand at the, at the pitcher's mound. The third baseman cannot abandon his base in case that there are wild throws or the runner goes off and advances. But the right fielder, the right fielder has to move up because that left fielder is going to throw to the second baseman. And if it gets past the second baseman, then the right fielder is the backup. The catcher technically can move over to back up the pitcher in case there's a bad throw to the shortstop. But ultimately, he cannot get too far from home plate. And you look at that and you'd say, Joe, you got all of that because the ball was hit to left field. And I would offer this to you, yes. Because when a baseball team is all in sync, everybody has a responsibility. So in a church, the education deacon says, well, I need teachers. And somebody else says, well, I didn't sign up to teach. It's not my job. Or an individual who works benevolent says, well, we we have benevolent cases. The other person says, that's not me. I'm not benevolence. And so they stand around with hands in their pockets sometimes. Here's the truth. A congregation that understands Freneo doesn't stand around. A family that understands Freneo doesn't say, well, that's my wife's responsibility, so she's going to just deal with it. That's my husband's. It's people who are on the same page working in what the Bible says is harmony. Have you ever heard a musical group sing with harmony? You ever heard a duet that just really knocked your socks off because how good they were? That's what this means. And you say, Joe, that's impossible. And I would offer this to you. If it were impossible, God would not require it of you. He's not going to require something of you and then turn around and not provide you the way. 
That's an unloving God. So the question then is this, what is the way? It's not a Mandalorian phrase. In the book of Philippians, the way is this. Look, if you will, at probably one of the most known passages of all the book of Philippians, chapter 2, verse 5. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus. That word attitude is the Greek word perneo. Some of your translations say mind. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Jesus, his example, is the satellite that sets the clock. It's not you. It's not the elders. It's Jesus. And when Jesus sets the clock, they will enjoy fellowship. And when they enjoy fellowship, they will enjoy joy like they've never experienced. That's what Paul wants for the church at Philippi. And I tell you this, you can have that even in your own marriage. You can have that within your family and in whatever congregation you go work with. But there's no shortcutting the ice cream Sunday model. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Matt, I appreciate it. Thank you, brother.